but why do you get those? Why do, why do you get those inflammatory cells in the first place? Why do they start attacking the hair follicle? That's an important question that we're still trying to answer and I'll get into it in a little bit. But the other thing I wanted to point out is look where the inflammatory cells are. And we can tell that when we look on biopsy, the inflammatory cells are not down here, down below, way at the bottom. That's, when, that's where we see it in alopecia areata. The inflammatory cells are up here near the sebaceous gland, near the stem cells. When the stem cells are damaged or destroyed, that's when there's really no hope of recovery. That's when the hair follicle cannot rebound. We can't get a new hair follicle to grow no matter what technology we use because those stem cells are absent. Right? So that's why scarring alopecias are permanent doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter whether you come to me or any other of my colleagues. If there is scar that is formed, we can't get a new hair to grow. Can we try to protect the, the hair at this stage? Yes, and that's really our prime goal is that we're trying to get the hair, the inflammatory cells to stop attacking so we don't end up here. Um, a lot of the research that I've been involved with tries to answer that question. What causes lichen planus pilaris? Why do, does that inflammatory assault occur in the first place? And I wanna introduce a term called pilosebaceous dysfunction. This is the hypothesis that we've been working with. So that there's um, some abnormality in the hair follicle that then leads to this inflammation. And we, we've identified as part of this research that there have been abnormalities, particularly of the sebaceous gland. And, and I, I, again, I said I'd get into a little bit of the weeds. You don't have to necessarily understand all of these terms here. Um, but within the sebaceous gland, there's loss of some essential um, biologic functions, essential cellular functions. There's a peroxisome proliferator receptor P par gamma, there's mitochondrial dysfunction. These may not all happen in the same people, but we know that the sebaceous gland can sometimes um, lose its normal cellular function. And when this happens, that's probably a trigger for the immune cells to say, hey, wait, there's, that, there's something going on here. And it's the normal function of the sebaceous gland, uh, sorry, of the immune system to attack abnormal tissue. Um, that's how we prevent cancer from happening. Your immune system is always on patrol looking for abnormal tissue. When it identifies abnormal tissue, it will delete that abnormal tissue. The other important concept here is the loss of immune privilege. Hair follicles not only are unique in that they have this regenerative capacity, but they also have something called immune privilege. What does that mean? Think of it almost like a force field around the hair follicles. Normally, the immune system patrols all tissues, and it does that in the hair follicle, but it has a little bit more tolerance for various cellular activities in the hair follicle. So it's not constant, the, the hair, especially the skin, it's, it has this uh, communication with the external world. So, um, the body understands that, the immune system understands that, and it gives it a little bit of leeway. Um, the, the hypothesis with scarring alopecia is that this normal functioning, this normal immune privilege is lost so that as soon as there's something abnormal happening in the hair follicle, slightly abnormal, the immune system pounces on it. Think of it that way. Now, is this you know, why does this happen? We still don't understand. And, and a lot more research is, is currently ongoing. I'm a visual person, I'm a dermatologist. So I, I, I went through a lot of, like I said, in the weeds science and I tried to boil everything down to, to simplify terms, but um, it always helps me to think of it visually. So we're back to our, our um, follicular-sebaceous unit here, our hair follicle. And these um, stem cells, which I said are, are essential in um, recreating the hair follicle, the sebaceous gland with its mitochondria, with its receptors functioning normally. So something happens that leads to 
dysfunction, pilosebaceous dysfunction, those normal cellular activities stop happening. And then you get this buildup potentially of these toxic lipids or these abnormal cells that build up in the cells of the hair follicle. And when this happens, then it's when those immune cells come in and start attacking. If they continue to attack unheated, then you will end up with scar. Okay, so um, hopefully I, I've helped convey what we know so far about the pathophysiology of, of um, lichen planopilaris. And again, once this invasion occurs, there may be uh, that it may occur because there's loss of immune privilege or some initial um, breakdown may then lead to further um, attack on other hair follicles. So complex process. Now that I've taken you through all of that, I wanted to get kind of to the part I'm sure a lot of you are, are um, interested in hearing about what are, what are our treatment options? And I, I think um, Dr. Lasico and Dr. Farah both drove this point home as well, is that we talk a lot about expectations. Unfortunately, I have patients who come in still to this day, referred from other dermatologists who think that, you know, I have some tool that the other dermatologist just wasn't willing to use to grow back hair. And, and again, I really take some time at the initial part of the visit is, okay, we, we for this reason, because the scar is there, I'm not going to be able to bring back the hair. But then I move on to what we can do. Okay, so um, we, we set out what our goals are, what our mutual goals are with the patient. So regrowth is not possible. But what is possible? What do we want to achieve? We want to decrease symptoms. Someone who's got constant itch, burn, and pain in the scalp. I want to fix that for you. We want to decrease inflammation. As we saw that inflammation, which manifests itself usually as that redness and scaling, um, is the root of the problem often with damaging those hair follicles. We want to protect um, and um, make sure that those, uh, as many hair follicles as we can. And of course, we want to prevent progression of the hair loss. Um, our goal is to um, you know, improve the scalp coverage to the point where that person, um, you know, my patient can feel comfortable with, with, um, with their hair and enjoy their hair. Photography measurements are a great way to try to um, guide our um, evaluation of response to treatment. Usually in my practice is to follow up with the patient once I've made the diagnosis. Every two to three months, that's the period of adjustment where we're trying to figure out the regimen. Um, Dr. Ferrer talked about coming up with a regimen. So we come up with a regimen. The first try may not always be the right one. We may need to do some adjusting, but we follow up with each other every two to three months until we find the right regimen. How do we know we found the right regimen? We talked about no further progression of hair loss, no itch, redness, or, or burning. Um, and those are uh, you know, questions I ask when patients come in. We look at photographs and we do comparisons. Once things are stable, then we continue that treatment. And uh, the lower photograph shows someone who, unfortunately, again, has lost hair in the middle, but doesn't have the redness, doesn't have the scaling, doesn't have any symptoms. So once we've achieved um, a good response with our treatments, then we continue therapy for another six, nine, 12 months after that. And I, I set this out at the beginning so patients are aware, what am I in for? What's happening? What does the future hold? Because sometimes that uncertainty is difficult. So um, we continue therapy for six to nine months. And then after that, we can, can you know, talk about um, scaling back on some of those treatments, removing some of the treatments. Um, I still usually keep a main, what I call a maintenance regimen. And then we, we monitor for recurrences. I can't make any promises that this may not come back. Um, as I've said, we're, we've learned a lot about the underpinnings, the roots of scarring alopecia, but we still have a lot to learn. Why does, in some people it burns out, why in some people it comes back. My approach to treatment, and again, there's many approaches to treatment. Your dermatologist may have a slightly different approach, but um, my, my grand scheme, my big picture, and again, I share with this with patients at the outs, um, outset, 
for scarring alopecias, th this is actually true for all alopecias, for all types of hair loss, um, but for scarring alopecias in particular, we're trying to suppress the inflammation. That's the number one um, goal that we have because that's the surefire way of, of protecting those hair follicles. And then um, once we've had a good success with that, we try to optimize hair growth and scalp coverage. And we'll talk about that as well. And last but not least, we try to avoid any triggers. We don't know what the triggers are for lichen planar pilaris, but there are some things that um, you know, we talk about in terms of maintaining healthy hair, maintaining healthy scalp, and uh, trying to avoid anything that may add to itch, that may add to inflammation. So um, suppressing inflammation. I break things down into tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, we talked about, uh, or Dr. Farah talked about risk versus benefits. We try to, I, I try to stay on the end of effective and low risk, and then I escalate my treatments as needed. We, we take on riskier medications or treatments that have a higher risk profile if our lower risk treatments are not effective. So that's what we call escalating on the therapeutic ladder. For almost everyone, I will give topical or injected corticosteroids. These are great anti-inflammatory medications. We inject them because the hair follicles are down deep and that's where the inflammation is. Topical corticosteroids as well, easy to use at home. Um, for patients um, who have more severe hair loss or have more severe inflammation, um, I will most often uh, give either an antibiotic or an anti-malarial or a combination of both. And um, I wanted to address the concern about antibiotics. Um, resistance, for most patients, we use antibiotics for the antibiotic, antibacterial effect. In these conditions, we're using them for the anti-inflammatory um, benefits. So we can decrease the dose to do sub um, therapeutic levels and still have anti-inflammatory effect. Um, I've included two um, treatments in red, PPAR gamma, and remember I touched on that, um, PPAR gamma agonists, these are the receptors that are important in cellular function, um, and oral retinoids. And the reason I put these in red is that they may be more specifically targeting some of the dysfunction that's happening in the sebaceous gland or in the oil gland. Whereas these other treatments that you see here in black are targeting the inflammatory cells in particular. PPAR gamma and oral retinoids, these are vitamin A receptor uh, treatments, may have more of a targeted treatment on the sebaceous glands as well as some anti-inflammatory effect. Oral prednisone, mycophenolate, cyclosporin, these are kind of what I call heavier duty treatments for um, patients who may have rapidly progressive, severe symptoms, I may reach for a tier three and then um, layer in a tier two and then slowly taper back on the tier three as um, things calm down. So this is kind of my treatment approach with the anti-inflammatory. You always want to have an anti-inflammatory on board. Um, I want to spend a minute um, just on the PPAR gamma agonist you or a lot of dermatologists don't typically use these medications. They're not part of our normal treatments for other skin disorders, but um, this is an FDA treatment approved for diabetes. And I know there was a question, is there any overlap of LPP and diabetes? Not per se. We haven't really seen it in our um, uh, kind of look. In our surveys, um, when, when we've looked at our demographics, I'm not aware of any clear um, overlaps with diabetes with LPP. There's some hints that it might be um, overlap with patients with CCCA, although we did a large study at Kaiser and did not see that association. But um, the, the overlap here is not so much with diabetes as it is with those PPAR gamma agonists. Fat cells have PPAR gamma receptors. Sebaceous glands have PPAR gamma receptors. So that's really the only overlap there. That's why we're using this diabetes drug for patients with LPP. 
Um, so we're targeting the sebaceous gland activity. It may promote improvement of those receptors that, uh, that are um, have dysfunction and may have anti-inflammatory effects. Um, there are some side effects, again, with anything that we do. There's some fluid retention because there are receptors on the kidneys as well. There, there are reports of cumulative dose bladder cancer, and by this we mean that if you continue to take this medication at high doses, which is usually given for diabetes, over more than one to two years, then there's potentially an increased risk for bladder cancer. For this condition, I do it low dose, less than a year. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I consider this not a, a true risk for my patient population. Um, here's a patient of mine at baseline. Um, sorry, the lower photo there, you can see um, that scaling and redness. Despite treatment with various anti-inflammatory treatments, she still had a lot of symptoms, a lot of redness. Um, we started her on pioglitazone, a low dose, and you can see here that um, the top photo is a little fuzzy, but the lower photo you, can, photo, you can see all that scaling and redness really significantly improved. She felt a lot better. Not everybody responds as in most of our treatments. It's not a one size fits all, but this can be something that can be part of your regimen. And it's not immune suppressive. It doesn't suppress the immune system like a lot of our other anti-inflammatory treatments. People have also asked me about JAK inhibitors. Um, Janus kinase inhibitor is what we call JAK. It's a new class of anti-inflammatory medications that are FDA approved for a number of inflammatory, autoimmune inflammatory skin disorders. So it's a good anti-inflammatory. I will tell you that we still don't have a lot of information for scarring alopecia, although in some small studies, case reports have shown some promise for the use of JAK inhibitors in lichen planum pilaris. So is it going to be better? Is it going to be more effective, more targeted? for treating that in those inflammatory cells that are attacking the hair follicles? I don't know yet. We don't know enough about the inflammation to confidently say that this is going to be better than other treatments. Um, is it promise? Yes, stay tuned, I would say. Again, um, lots of side effects, risk benefits to consider. I would still say that when treating with antibiotics, treating with antimalarials, those probably have a longer, um, safer safety profile than JAK inhibitors. Um, we, we talked about um, anti-inflammatory medication then as part of our treatment kind of overview. We said we wanted to optimize hair growth. So, um, and, and Dr. Lucico mentioned is that background hair growth. So all the other hair that's still there, we want to optimize them. And the best way to do this is minoxidil, either topical or oral. A lot of us are going to low dose oral minoxidil because it's not, and we're not putting one more thing on the scalp that may cause irritation. And just to give you a visual, we're back to our, our diagram here of the hair fiber, the follicular sebaceous unit, the hair fiber there. And what the minoxidil does is it just really plumps up that hair fiber. So it's a, think of it like a fertilizer. It's a non-specific hair growth promoter. Um, finasteride, it's another medication that can help. Um, it's called a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. 5-alpha reductase type 2 is mainly on the lower portion of the hair follicle. It plumps up um, that hair follicle kind of in a different mechanism than minoxidil does. Um, some of us like using dutasteride. It's a cousin of, of finasteride. And the reason why we like this for scarring alopecia in particular is that 5-alpha reductase type 1 um, dutasteride, as you can tell, it, it targets 5-alpha reductase type 1 and 2. Type two is the hair follicle, type one is on the sebaceous gland. So in some ways you're getting a two for one. You, we talked about how important that sebaceous gland activity is. So it may be protecting both. Um, last but not least, we, um, a lot of questions came up around this treatment, avoiding triggers. Um, and, and I don't know if avoiding triggers is the best way to, to the best term for this necessarily, but anything, I think, uh, you know, um, when we talked about scarring alopecia, it's like your scalp is on fire, the, the hair follicles are being burned. It's, it's like a forest fire. I think of this aspect of treatment as not adding any fuel to the fire. It's probably not the initial source of the fire, but anything that you can do to um, avoid feeding that fire is going to be to your benefit. Um, so are things like chemicals and fragrances and tight hairstyles, are those a cause of LPP? No, we don't really think so. 
but can it add fuel to the fi fire? Possibly. Is it mo easily modifiable? Yes. I can't change your genetics. I can't change your age. I can't ch change your kind of inflammatory profile. But these are things that we can change. And if they're causing any added irritation, let's remove them. That's kind of my stance on, on this aspect. Some people will do patch testing. This is a form of allergy testing to see if you have any true allergies to any chemicals that you could potentially avoid um, and decrease any inflammation or irritation. Uh, life, lifestyle modifications, I hear a lot about this. Should I do an anti-inflammatory diet? Shall I do a gut cleanse? Um, shall I, you know, another, another part of this diet. Um, these are all, again, if you do them under the, uh, guidance of a, a board certified dermatologist, a, you know, board certified internist. Um, there's no risk to it. You're not putting out a lot of money for this. Um, I think, and you know, it's going to help your heart. It's going to help your your gut. It's going to help your liver. I think that's fine. Meditation, exercise, good sleep. I don't think we can est underestimate the bonus, the benefits of that. Taking a multivitamin daily, um, eating healthy. Those are all great things to do and, and certainly can, and, you know, incorporate that into your treatment regimen, but don't think of this as being the primary source of the disease that, um, and don't think of it as a primary treatment for your disease. I wanted to end here with um, people asking me about clinical trials, new treatments. I encourage you all to go, if you haven't already, look at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, and put in lichen plano pilaris. I did this last night and pulled this up. There's 10 studies out there. Some are recruiting, some are studies that are for patients, some are drugs that are not. Um, and you can just kind of get a sense of what's out there, what people are thinking of, some new anti-inflammatory medications that people are looking into and keep an eye on there as the things that may be coming in the future. Uh, so this is a patient of mine who had a, a great sense of humor. Um, but just to summarize, we talked about making the diagnosis, what makes lichen planus pilaris, um, loss of the follicular markings, the inflammation, um, using dermoscopy, that magnifying to really take a good look, because sometimes it's hard to tell um, just from a distance. We talked about pilosebaceous dysfunction as being a source of lichen planus pilaris. Um, and as far as treatment management, we talked about the um, triad of treatment, suppress the inflammation, optimize hair growth and then avoid triggers. So I'll leave it there and go to questions. I'll stop sharing. Okay. Divya, I'm gonna hand things over to you, how you'd like to hand, um, handle questions. And I'd love to drag you in to, to answer questions with me. We can share those. Shall we? Yes, sure. Thank you so much for this talk. I think you hit home a lot of the points that I also agree, you know, completely agree and like to discuss with patients in their initial consultation. And as we go along, um, Katie, I know is assisting us with the questions. So I think Great, um, she'll field them to both of us and okay. we can go from there. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. So I have the list of pre-submitted questions. I can just read them aloud or I could share my screen to put them up. Um, and then we also have some questions that were submitted during the course of the session. Okay. Um, do you want me to just read them to you or should I put some up on the screen? Oh, go ahead and put them up on the screen. Then we yep. can all see the, the question. Okay. Can you see? Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay, so I think we, we answered the jack inhibitor question. I think promising, but stay tuned. Yes, and I'll also add for jack inhibitors because I wanted to refresh myself and see what's there currently in research. It is really more case series and case reports. We have yet to have big trials that will look at this at a larger scale. Um, interestingly, there's data in lichen planus, which is kind of like a cousin of lichen planopilaris, where it's more lesions on the skin that have the same type of or very similar inflama inflammatory pattern. And there's been promising data there as well. So I agree with what Dr. Mimrani said about stay tuned, because um, right now it's also not just 
an individual therapy, but added on to people's treatment plans. So it's yet to be determined what's the sole effect of how much it can contribute. But um, mainly in the cases of refractory, like in Plano Pilaris, where other things have been tried, um, and it, you have to weigh the benefits and risks and have a very detailed conversation because it's considered a long-term treatment. Well said. And, and again, I think a lot of the treatments that are now being used for psoriasis, a lot of our biologic treatments that have come out for psoriasis, there have been some interesting um, case reports and series. And I know that for one of our treatments, so that it was being evaluated in a stage two clinical trial that did not meet the endpoints. So um, we really have to be patient and look for that data. Great. Um, we'll go to um, question um, regarding the liver and doxycycline. Um, I, I don't typically, first of all, um, I think I conveyed my approach to treatment. This is, I don't necessarily think of this as a doxycycline as being a forever treatment. Um, I give my anti-inflammatory treatments until the inflammation is quieted. And that, then I would continue for another six to nine months. And then I tend to scale back and give you a break. It's very possible that there may be a player, a, a flare of the, of the condition, we have to go back on it um, for some time. Um, but this isn't something that I put you on and keep you on forever. We have a lot of patients who take doxycycline for acne and other inflammatory disorders. And so we have a very long-term safety data. Um, and I, I would feel reassured in having patients on this without any serious side effects or long-term health concerns. I'll also jump in. For doxycycline, I agree that we want to stay on the, I would say the lowest effective dose um, for the, you know, the amount of time that's appropriate, but it is more of a detailed conversation. So you might start at a higher dose and if you achieve a period of stability, we can now move to what Dr. Mamrani also mentioned, these sub antimicrobial doses. So they don't affect, you know, the gut microbiota while also having some anti-inflammatory effect. And that's what we want to use this for. Now, as far as the GI side effects, gastrointestinal side effects, they're mainly um, related to reflux, esophagitis, some peptic ulcer disease, liver less commonly. Um, in fact, if there's a liver um, related side effect, it's most commonly in the first couple of weeks of taking doxycycline. And that's an immunoallergic type of side effect. Um, there hasn't really been any long-term concerning side effect with doxycycline like accumulating in the liver that I'm aware of. Um, but there are some providers who might do, you know, liver function blood work tests to just monitor depending on your health conditions. Um, so that's something that could just be tested periodically if you're on it for a certain amount of time and that ends up being um, worth checking. Uh, the, the next question here, um, prescribing, what would you prescribe as an anti-inflammatory to a patient who's allergic to petroleum derivatives and cannot take hydroxychloroquine? I, I'm not going to um, answer specific um, uh, treatment related questions, but in general, I will say that there are a lot of options. Uh, we put up uh, on my um, talk, there are a lot of anti-inflammatory treatment options. So I would encourage you to discuss um, those options with your dermatologist um, and come up with a regimen that works well for you. Um, there are, are plenty of non-petroleum um, derivatives that can be used and other things other than hydroxychloroquine. Um, we talked a little bit about new treatments. And again, I encourage you to go um, to talk to your dermatologist, to um, go to clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, there are new things coming. Um, okay. Any new research findings on LPP that helps better understand the disease and potential treatments? Yes. So I would say that is ongoing. So a lot of scientific studies that are ongoing. Um, did I'll you add just one piece. More? I, I was I was say, um, <laughs> so I know that there are a lot of questions related to JAK inhibitors, just on a quick look. And some of the research is looking at 
what type of inflammation, what kind of inflammatory signaling patterns are occurring in LPP. And um, there's something called interferon gamma that's, you know, that signaling has um, shown to be increased. So the JAK pathway or JAK stat pathway is kind of upstream. And we've seen that when the JAK pathway is activated, this interferon gamma signaling goes up. So these are the kinds of, um, you know, information or basic science related studies that help us understand, you know, where are our future targets? And for now, they might be more general targets, like gen generally targeting the JAK pathway, but we're trying to get more specific. I like that a lot. I tell my patients that the inflammatory system is like your military. It's, it's built to protect you. And there's different arms of the military. You've got your Navy, you've got your Air Force, you've got your ground troops. So not all anti-inflammatory cells are built the same. There's a lot of variability. There's a lot of crosstalk. So it's, it's a very complicated, very redundant, um, very intertwined system. And we, we, we've learned a lot, but we still have a lot more to learn. Um, at, even within alopecia areata, where we've identified the JAK pathways as being really important, and we've been able to, to block that pathway with our treatments, not everybody responds. So um, we still have a lot to learn, but there's, there's a lot coming. Divya, did you want to take a stab at another question that we, yes, another topic? I think you've, sure. you've summarized some of them. <laughs> yes, uh, let's see here. Um, so uh, just um, with the highlighted question on seven, um, there is a question about these folded over and not normal hairs. It's hard to know exactly, you know, when you describe versus when you're examining in person, because when you ex examine, we have a dermatoscope, also known as a trichoscope, where you can really magnify and see what's happening around the hair. Um, is it in an area where we're concerned for active scarring? So there's some additional information that would be helpful, but of interest, there is this type of phenomenon called Pilatorty, it might be pronounced a little differently, but where inflammation and fibrosis near the follicle, um, especially near the hair stem cells, so that whole area, it causes the hair that when it's trying to protrude the hair shaft, there can be some kinking or distortion. So we are learning more about this phenomenon. Um, I'm not saying that this is exactly the answer in this situation, but um, details that on exam become um, more of a discussion and we share what we see. Yeah, yeah, I agree. There's, uh, with that inflammation comes a lot of distortion of the normal structure. I can think of it like a, if you think of it like a hair bulb, that, that hair may be able to, that flower may be able to bloom, but it may not be quite the same because of some of that inflammatory distortion, that scarring, we're able to, to save to some extent the hair follicle, but not completely. So the hairs may look a little bit different or distorted, finer, thinner. And that's where the role of that hair growth promotion comes in as well, to try to maximize, optimize the growth as much as possible of those hair follicles. Yes, I think that kind of transitions nicely to these next questions about, you know, can hair regrow? And I know you've covered this as well. Um, so there's the question of what is considered the scarred area and where you want to, um, you know, make sure that this is the area on exam that we feel, you know, topical medications might not be so effective because the, unfortunately the destruction has occurred to that level where it's hard to recover those hairs. But we really want to target those hairs in proximity that are still viable, those follicles that may have some early damage but not yet are at the point of no, no recovery. Um, so a, a lot of the treatments are that's why there's a lot of combination treatment plans. Some are anti-inflammatory, some are helping the hair follicles, you know, health, um, and also reversing something called miniaturization, which we see very commonly in female pattern, male pattern hair loss. And over, you know, half the population can have this type of hair loss in parallel. So we're trying to boost density nearby, increase coverage, and that may look like regrowth, but we're targeting the hairs, um, you know, in a more strategic way so that we can have improvement. Um, and sometimes we, you know, there's a question about hair transplantation, for example. Um, yes, you can move follicles into an area, you know, theoretically, 
but if there's active inflammation, you risk, um, you know, destruction to those follicles. So that's not always a straightforward approach. And it needs, um, you need to understand, is the inflammation active? Has there been a period of stability? Um, are we, uh, have we given about two years? There's still debate even within dermatologists and hair transplant community when we can start looking at those other um, alternative approaches. Well, that's great. I, I, I'm prone to analogies, Divya, so I'll, I'll give my analogy for regrowth. And again, going back to that forest fire, it, it, it's truly a forest fire that um, you're dealing with, with scarring alopecias. And there's that fire comes through and it burns the, the trees. And in some cases, the, the roots are damaged along with that. So if the roots are gone, the trees are gone then there's no there's no regrowth that doesn't matter what you do you're not going to get a new tree to to bloom same thing with with hair transplantation it doesn't mix tree from uh, you know somebody else's backyard and try to plant it into that forest fire if there's still burning embers if there's still inflammation that that tree is not going to survive even when the embers are gone, when the, the fire is, and we usually we say we wait a year, we wait two years to make sure nothing's going to flare up again. It's, there's a lot of ash. There's a lot of debris. Um, your transplant into that area of scar is it's not healthy tissue. It doesn't have that surrounding structure for that hair to really survive very well. So most people who get hair transplants, either it doesn't take or the take is not as good as you would normally have in, in, a, um, in a normal tissue. So um, what we're trying to do, if you want, again, we talked about shifting our focus, we're looking at the trees that are still standing. And some of them may, may be burnt, some of them you know, may have black soot on them, but we're feeding those, we're protecting those, we're watering those, we're giving them a, a lot of fertilizer to get those hairs as healthy as possible to then give cover to the areas where the, the trees are missing. That's, that's a great way of explaining it. Um, so I, I'm going to go to um, the question in 10. So, um, if, you know, LPP seems like it's active and you're trying a lot of different things and still not feeling like you're achieving a significant level of improvement or things are getting worse, um, definitely I have, you know, multiple questions in my mind. You know, one is, have we tried eliminating these potential contact allergens? Because now we have more information about things in our hair care and our face or, um, you know, sunscreen uh, related products that could potentially aggravate um, the LPP. I would also wonder if there is something called telogen effluvium, which is a type of reversible shedding hair loss, but it can have multiple triggers. And this could be a whole talk in itself, but ranging from you know grief level stress or having COVID or a similar illness or surgery, um, there are a lot of reasons for people to experience shedding um, and different, you know, even people can have more than one type of hair loss in parallel. So you wanna discuss with a specialist, make sure you're, um, uh, like wonder, understanding if there's only one diagnosis here, um, what are the options that haven't been considered? I know it's easier for me to say it this way, but it requires multiple conversations. Um, and you can always ask for another opinion with someone else if, if that helps. You need to definitely advocate for yourself. Um, and part of what we're you know trying to do is give our perspective and our experience. Um, and I will also add another layer, which is, unfortunately, LPP can be unpredictable. And even when you do a lot of good things, you know, by the books, evidence-based, it can it can still flare and it can be challenging. Um, so I hope at least it kind of frames it. Um, so some things to think about food for thought. I'll, I'll take a, a, another question. Um, uh, there was a question about injections in the scalp. How often should that happen? So injections are injections of corticosteroids or cortisone. Uh, these are done as, an, as a source of treating the inflammation. So that's one of go-to treatment for most dermatologists to do cortisone inject injections. Um, 
the dose of the cortisone in, of the cortisone that's injected, the frequency is often dependent on how severe the hair loss is or, or the inflammation is. But I would say that I usually don't do it more frequently than every six to eight weeks. And the reason for that is that if you do too much cortisone, you can see the side effects of those cortisones um, in the scalp. You can get indentations uh, or you can thin the, the scalp skin, but you need that um, deeper tissue to provide a healthy cushion for the hair follicles. Um, so that's something that it may be particular to you and particular to your dermatologist, but no more frequent than every six to eight weeks. Did you want to take the next one? Sure. So is it possible that LPP can cause swelling and pain in lymph nodes in the neck? Um, I'm not aware of that being something that's an association. Uh, so that I would recommend, you know, having an evaluation with your physician. Um, some things that are definitely, you know, more, uh, there, there, there's a range of reasons for why lymph nodes can be swollen, whether it's from, you know, viral illness, but some things are even more serious potentially. Um, so that requires definitely just further evaluation, make sure there's no other serious autoimmune or even um, sometimes worse, like cancerous processes. So um, not trying to scare anyone, but there can be a whole range of things and this requires further evaluation. I'll take the next one. Um, best treatment, I think we address that when hydroxychloroquine may not work. Talk to your doctor about that. There are other options. Sometimes there's combination. So we're looking at the regimen, we're looking at the whole picture um, and make sure you find a regimen that will work for you. Sometimes it can take a couple of tries. There's no one size fits all for sure. Um, and then I think we already answered the next question is allergy testing relevant? If you feel that there may be something that's still triggering itch irritation of your scalp. I think I have more of a concern um, with frontal fibrosing alopecia, which is a different type of scarring alopecia with lichen plano pilaris that may or may not be as relevant, but of course, anything we can do to remove, um, you know, triggers or uh, always a good strategy. So if, if you're doing something and it itches or it burns a hairspray, um, any chemicals, perm, avoid it. On the flip side, a lot of people come to me saying, do I have permission to, hair, to dye my hair? Do I have permission to do this? Well, you know, I want you to enjoy your hair. Feel free to do something that, you know, um, you want to do, do a test, put a chemical behind your ear. If it's a hair dye, um, test it for a few days and see if it causes any redness, itch or burn before applying it all over. Okay, so let's go to, um, you know, there's a medical term called cranial prosthesis. This kind of refers to wigs or even um, toppers, other um, ways to cover um, the scalp. So there are um, improvements, and I think this can be a great option. Um, it can be a solution for some patients. And I think Dr. Lucico was mentioning, you know, how this could be a prescription and even a medical letter of necessity can go along with that if it's helpful. And there are, you know, usually the hair specialists, um, like myself, we keep a list of um, places where patients can go to that are kind of geographic. So um, you just ask your hair specialist if they know of any good places to look. I would also mention that it doesn't just have to be, the, the support groups are a great source. People will tell you, this is what I did. Um, peer to peer help is is wonderful when you're, when you're seeking, um, uh, this kind of uh, help in terms of cosmetic coverage, but the National Alopecia Areata Foundation, it doesn't matter what kind of hair loss you have, you can get support from other hair loss societies, whether it's, you know, you lost your hair due to chemotherapy, genetics, um, autoimmune, or whatever, um, seeking help from others can be real, real boost. Um, I'll take the next question. How do you determine whether someone has combined um, condition, you know, type of hair loss, LPP, androgenetic alopecia, fibrosing alopecia, does it matter? Um, 
often people don't come in with one pure textbook kind of um, hair loss. Often there's a combination of, of things going on and that's where our expertise as dermatologists, as, as hair loss um, specialists comes into play. Sometimes I will focus on the first priority, which is the lichen planus pilaris, but then I will turn my attention to the underlying androgenetic alopecia after the inflammation has calmed down. Doesn't matter so much what type of scarring alopecia you have, whether you have a combination. No, it's still, you go down to the basics of um, treating the inflammation, um, treating the underlying hair thinning. It does make a difference in terms of what particular anti-inflammatory I may select, your prognosis, where the hair uh, thinning may occur. With lichen plano pilaris, it's usually patchy spots around the scalp with frontal fibrosing. It's mostly along the hairline. Um, but as far as treatment, my selection, it may not make that much of a difference. Um, and then the next part of this question is the topical corticosteroids. Should they be continued indefinitely? Um, again, it depends on part of your regimen. I do rely on topical corticosteroids heavily for anti-inflammatory effect. But then once things subside, yes, I may scale back, back on them. But then sometimes after I've um, scaled you back on the oral medications, then I might bring back the topicals. The, the topicals are kind of my ground troops, making sure that they stay vigilant, that nothing flares up. There's no fires, no embers. Um, but sometimes I need the helicopters. And then, uh, you know, the oral heavy duty medications, and then we scale back and go back to those, those ground troops. All right, I'll go to the next one. So um, it's regarding what can be the course of LPP. So it can vary. Uh, it is unpredictable. Some folks, most, uh, most of the time, what I see is kind of patchy involvement and that's more of a classic pattern, but there can be diffuse. Doesn't necessarily mean all the hair is affected, but just the regions of the scalp that are involved. Uh, and like there are some new patterns that are also being discussed, but I'd say it's less common for it to be that extreme from what I've seen. That's correct. And, and I think also when we're setting expectations, I usually tell my patients wherever they are when they come in to be diagnosed, that's my goal is to keep them there and not have any further hair loss. So if you come to me with very extensive hair loss already, then we try to keep you there um, and prevent any further hair loss. That is the goal um, with treatment. Does hair dye bleaching cause inflammation scarring? Again, that's something I think we've kind of answered that question. I'll go to the next one. If it burns, if it itches, don't do it. Um, how long is it recommended that you stay on treatments? Again, um, my treatment approach is I tinker with your regimen. Every two to three months you come in to see me. Once we find a regimen where things are feeling good and by feeling good, um, no itch, irritation, no progression of hair loss, um, then we keep you on that regimen for another nine to 12 months. And then we can start tapering you back off. All right. And the next one, we also kind of touched on where you can look for support. Um, there are some links in the chat and definitely at the end of the program today, th th those will be available to everyone. And like Dr. Mimrani said, to even consider looking at the National Alopecia Areata Foundation for resources, they also have um, some similar questions that overlap. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I can also just try to go to the next one here. So, okay. I know it's um, it's hard to you know answer more individual questions, but as I can see, you know, definitely a lot of people have tried different combinations of uh, medications, and um, if it's still not going in the right direction, that requires more detailed evaluation. But if as far as suggestions, um, we kind of covered what you can do to avoid these contact potential contact allergens or irritants and products. Um, and special diet, I also echo with Dr. what Dr. Perry Mirani said already. Um, and there aren't any specific supplements or new, you know, botanicals that have any great evidence. So I would go for, you know, your well-balanced, healthy diet, discuss with your uh, primary if there's any particular nutrition goals that need to be uh, checked. 
For hair specifically, I will check for um, you know ferritin, which is an iron storage um, marker, and optimize that. Uh, vitamin D, um, either it's checked or we do a daily supplement. And uh, hemoglobin A1C can be relevant for hair loss, um, and there's more emerging evidence for that, um, which is a, a way to check for blood sugar control. Uh, so those are just some additional thoughts I have on this. Um, and I think there's a question about these medications for um, diabetes that can cause some weight loss. So with rapid weight loss or even gradual weight loss within a year time of uh, seven to 10 pounds can see a dis disruption to the hair cycle, triggering something called telogen effluvium, which is uh, different from scarring hair loss, but can trigger massive shedding uh, usually a few months later. So that is something that we're seeing more and more in the clinic it's good to be aware of this, though, because it's more common that people are trying to take these medications and they wonder if their LPP is flaring. Um, I can't see the questions anymore, so I guess we might be wrapping up here. I was just going to transition I, I, us to some of the sure. new questions from the Oh, side. perfect. Okay. Oh, okay. I did, I did think of one other topic that uh, one other, um, th there were a lot of questions about um, uh, topicals and creams and how to fill it how to apply them. What one point I did want to make is that when your dermatologist asks you to use a topical cortisone, for example, uh, I want it to be very clear that you're applying that topical to those surrounding hairs. There's no need to apply the medication or do the injection to the area where the scar has already occurred, where there's loss of follicles. There's no point in putting fertilizer where there's no roots. You want to really put the cortisone, protect those hair follicles that are on the outer edges of a part that where you've had hair loss. So that's the area that you want to focus on. And it can be hard. It's really hard to, you know, an area you can't see, do your best. It's not going to cause harm if you get some cortisone in areas that are normal. Um, that's totally fine. And it's fine if you put it on the scarred area. But again, the goal is to get it uh, to those surrounding hair follicles that may be under attack, that may have some char on them, but aren't burning and you, you want to keep them from getting destroyed. Yes, I agree with it. And um, I, I can see our more recent questions here now. Okay. Um. So um, just kind of zooming in on the question about burning, um, which can be a symptom that can be very um, you know, frustrating to have. There are some treatments that are uh, more targeted towards that. And I think we're still gonna have more emerging approaches um, such as gabapentin, uh, low-dose naltrexone. So those are some things that come to mind. And I already see you have tried low-dose naltrexone. So gabapentin, you know, oral or topical, some is a thought that comes to mind. And I don't know, Dr. Mamrani, if you have any other yeah, thoughts. Yeah, I agree with that. Low-dose naltrexone can help with that burning. Um, I've also, um, antihistamines can be helpful mm -hmm. um, in certain situations and acetylcysteine I've used. Um, and that's where some of our alternative treatments I've had patients um, uh, Work, work with an acupuncturist even. So those burning symptoms can be really frustrating. Um, think of it as the, the nerve endings as being inflamed and irritated. So sometimes it's not just your hair follicle, but all the structure that the follicular sebaceous unit, there's a lot of nerve endings, there's blood vessels. There's a lot happening there. When those nerve endings get irritated, they can continue to send off firing or continue to fire off signals. And we're trying everything to tamp down on those signals. And that can be hard to do, but that's another area where you try to remove any triggers that may be adding fuel to the fire. Um, but there are nerve specific treatments in particular. Um, I'll take, uh, let's see. Um, okay. Um, I, I, don't want to um, get into too much individual specific treatments, but again, um, treatments for scarring alopecia do need to include anti-inflammatory medications in, in addition to uh, hair growth medications. So um, 
it's not so important which one is selected. Is it hydroxychloroquine? Is it doxycycline? Or is it P4-gamma? But some anti-inflammatory, some hair growth, that's going to be the, the makings of a good regimen. And, and you'll have to work within that. Um, how do you differentiate scaling from lichen pilaris from seborrheic dermatitis? Um, how can you tell where the itch is coming from? These are great questions. And sometimes that um, we struggle with as well. Um, so with lichen plano pilaris, the inflammation, the scaling is cuffed around the hair follicle. Some of those photos I showed you where the, there was scaling, that scaling is cuffed and tightly wound around the hair follicle because that's where the inflammation is. With seborrheic dermatitis, the inflammation is all over. It's diffuse. And if you look carefully, there's kind of scaling on the skin, there's scaling around the hair. And so it's a different appearance. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to distinguish the two. Some of the treatments are equal for both. Um, any association between lichen plano pilaris and other conditions? There are a lot of lichens out there, lichen sclerosis, autoimmune diseases. It's possible. I think there's um, some sense that if you have this tendency for excessive inflammation, pro-inflammation, that you may have tendency to get inflammation in other tissues. It's not uniform by any means. But if someone with lichen plano pilaris comes and tells me, oh, my dentist told me I have lichen planus in the mouth, I'm not surprised. Patient comes and tells me, oh, I've got a rash on my back. I look at it, it's lichen planus. I'm not surprised. Um, so is there an association per se? No, um, not strong, but we do see these co-occur. I'll answer the PPAR gamma yeah. question. Um, do you believe pugilism loses efficacy over some time? Is the PPAR gamma theory still the best theory of what is the cause of OPP? I wouldn't say it's the best theory um, because not everybody you put on PPAR gamma has a robust re um, response. I'll, I'll say that there's probably many different ways in which dysfunction can occur, in which the normal function, the normal complex function of that tissue can go awry and lead to this snowstorm, the snowballing effect of inflammation, scarring, ongoing. And what we're trying to do is find the best way of stopping that inflammation, stopping that snowball. And it can be hard to do. Um, like I said in my slides, some people respond gangbusters, other people respond meh, other people like, what is this you gave me? A, you know, it's no different than placebo. So um, there's probably more to the story than just PFAR gamma, but it's one tool that we have. Does it lose efficacy over time? No, I find that the responders are, are responders and they respond very quickly, usually within the first month. And the non-responders don't gain response. I, I've tried increasing the dose, um, but no, it doesn't seem to do any good. Um, most people, again, I will put them on a PFAR gamma. They respond, we keep them on it for six to nine months, maybe 12 and then uh, try to taper them off um, and to have some sort of a maintenance regimen and make sure that we jump on things if there's any flares. All right, and then the next one. So uh, similar question about if you're not seeing improvement, should you consider changing your treatment plan? It really depends. Um, it depends what has been started. It also depends if you've done you know, the homework of clearing your hair products and your face and your face care products, sunscreens. Um, so I'd, I want to see what's the regimen already and if I can introduce some changes there. Um, and then, of course, you always want to discuss, though, is there an opportunity to add a treatment? It might be a good idea. Um, but yeah, it, it depends on a lot of factors here. Very individual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, then That's where the art of medicine comes right. in, huh? Exactly. And, you know, what, what can be changed still while, you know, have we addressed everything already? And there's a benefit for everybody's different. And for some right. person, one medication may not be a good idea because of their other medical factors. So these are all individual issues. That, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just jump into the next one about dutasteride. So um, it, it can be helpful, especially because it also targets the patterned hair loss. So, um, it, it can vary. Some people even take it twice a week, but I would say it's more common between the five to seven times a week uh, or, you know, daily. So that's what I would say about that. Yeah, I would say I usually started off a daily and then scaled back, particularly in some men who may have some sexual side effects. 
uh, while on a high, the daily dose, we scale back to three times a week, they do just fine. Um, or, you know, somebody doesn't want to take medication daily, um, but it is a long acting medication and can be dosed less frequently than daily. Right. Um, now for Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine, can this be taken uh, lifelong or is there a time limit? Um, this can be taken for many years. It requires monitoring, um, especially for the ocular side effects. We say, you know, after about five years, um, you can um, have more risk for that. So again, conversation about benefits and risks and requires monitoring um, and, you know, discussion with physician as far as how effective is this and what is our plan for this? Um, do we know how safe JAK inhibitors are like Illumiant? Um, so there have been a lot of clinical trials looking at JAK inhibitors initially in rheumatoid arthritis. There's also, it's also being used in patients with um, inflammatory bowel disorders and now with alopecia areata. Our alopecia areata patients on these medications are younger, generally healthier. So many of, although this is, this is also a different JAK inhibitor than the ones that have been used for rheumatoid arthritis. So there are some black box warnings on the JAK uh, inhibitors. And by black box warnings, I mean the, the package insert comes with specific warnings that the FDA asked to um, have on there, particularly um, cardiac um, issues and patients older than 65 death, uh, all cause death. Um, and uh, blood clots. So these are very serious um, issues that we really didn't see as much of in the younger patients, alopecia areata patients. Um, however, those risks are still something to be uh, wary of, um, increased risk of malignancy also. Um, so these are issues that if somebody's a smoker, has had a, skin, uh, has had a cancer, or is prone to blood clots, I will not select a JAK inhibitor. So there, there are risks and benefits and you have to go through each person individually and, and have that discussion. A uh, fatty liver, not so much. Um, uh, more, more changes in the lipid profile with the JAK inhibitor. And I'll, I'll answer the next question. Um, there is a Kaiser in uh, Colorado. Um, so I do sometimes uh, consult remotely with patients in, in Colorado. So that's what that showed. There are doctors with hair specialty in Colorado. I know Dr. David Norris was... Um, uh, participated, University of Colorado participated in the National Alopecia Areata Foundation registry. I think he may be um, still seeing patients, may have pulled back, but there are certainly folks in Colorado who, who you could see. Okay, and then for the low level, low level laser or low level light therapy, these devices, um, it's very uh, early still. I think we have, we're in, it's an emerging treatment, but the side effect profile doesn't seem to be very concerning. So uh, something I can say on this is there are different types of devices like the caps, but there's also combs that um, have more contact with the scalp and also these band-like devices, and they do vary in price. So I have seen that the combs and the band-like devices tend to be less expensive. Um, so, and they have um, similar or even sometimes even greater effectiveness, but these are very small uh, sets. Of, these are small sets of data that we're really looking at. Uh, so I wouldn't say there is one that I'd say is my go-to, or if this is the first um, treatment I would consider for a patient, this could be more like an add-on. Um, but also curious for Dr. Marani if she wants to weigh in. Uh, but uh, the I'm, I, yeah, I'm on the same boat as you. There have been no, we, we call them comparative efficacy studies. So we compare one study, one treatment to the next. Nobody's taken all the different light devices and compared them to each other. There are small studies of one or two of the individual um, light devices. Some have not had any um, studies that have been done. So um, I would say that this is falls into my adjunctive treatment category, meaning that once you've gotten inflammation under control, there's some good data suggesting that these laser devices, low-level laser devices, are helpful for background androgenetic or hereditary thinning. So you can add that on. Um, in some of my patients, it's caused a little bit of burning or irritation, and then, okay, stop. Um, and other people, maybe it's been beneficial. I wouldn't say it's gangbusters for um, scarring alopecias, more for the background androgenetic. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer the next one. Is it advisable to stop disease inflammation prior to starting oral minoxidil? I don't think it needs to be um, sequential. Um, 
I just want to really drive home the fact that if you're trying to add fertilizer to a burning forest, yeah, you know, it's not gonna, you're not gonna get a lot of gain there. So you want to put out the fire as a priority. That's your number one priority to save hair follicles. Can you add in fertilizer um, as you're putting up, you know, okay, I saved some hair follicles, I can add in fertilizer and get the hairs to grow that aren't anywhere near the, the fire, that's fine. Okay. Thank you everyone for your engagement. And um, thank you, Divya and Katie also for, for tag teaming, appreciate it. Thanks for your Thank time. you. Yes, thanks for everyone's participation. And it looks like we'll move to our main room now to continue the last part of the program. <laughs>